the Electronic Alliance brings you another in a series of technical presentations to continually educate you in product design and manufacturing. Today's session is about touchscreens, a touchy story about how they work. We welcome Tony Gray, the director of PCAP at Dayward Technologies. Anytime you need to find a qualified source for your design and manufacturing needs, contact the Electronics Alliance. Gary told me I need to come up with some cute title and get everybody's attention, so I was hoping that that, that would work. PCAP, a touchy subject. Um, my, my goal here today is to sort of give you a, a brief introduction to the basic technology of how a touch panel works. Um, a lot of us, probably all of us, are familiar with at least the concept of a touch panel, you know, a cell phone, a tablet, or whatever, but there, you may not have a real understanding of what's actually happening at the lower technology level. So I'm going to start with a really basic introduction to what is a PCAP touch panel, how does it work, how do you figure out where a finger is, what are the parts of it, and then we'll get into what the physical components are that make up that touch panel, how do you actually construct a touch panel, um, and what are the different layers that go into it, how do you integrate it into a product. And then I also have a few slides at the end that cover um, a little bit of extra information on some of the topics if we have time to get into all of that. It just kind of depends on how fast we go, how slow we go. So um, I already covered all this. Um, the, the one interesting thing I think about this is that before I started doing this, I was writing embedded software. So my background really is software. Um, my degree is technically in computer engineering, which is a combination of double E classes as well as comp sci classes. But I spent most of my career doing more computer science-y kind of stuff and have never really been all that comfortable with analog um, you know, circuits. That's just not my forte. And now here I am talking to everybody about electric fields and capacitors and charging, and it's a very strange thing for me that I suddenly morphed into this you know, sort of analog guy when I'm not really an analog guy. Um, what do we do? I already mentioned this a little bit. We design and manufacture touch panels, um, and then we basically integrate all the bits and pieces that might go around that. So we start with a touch panel, uh, and then we add on a cover lens, a display, um, maybe some shielding, maybe a few brackets. Um, we might modify the display if you need it to, to have a higher bright, uh, higher bright backlight, you know, whatever. But basically, we take all of those bits and pieces, put them together, <laughs> manufacture them, and sell them to our customers. Almost all of our customers are in America. Um, we have one company that we work with in Germany who does some European sales. We don't do anything in Asia right now other than manufacturing, but we don't have any customers in Asia. All of our stuff is low to medium volume, high mix, high complexity, industrial, you know, medical, embedded, um, stuff that needs to be around for, you know, 10 years that might be 1,000 to 5,000 EAU, you know, per piece or whatever it's going to be. We don't do consumer. We don't do 100,000 pieces a year of anything. Um, we tend to do stuff that's more complex and, and higher margin kind of stuff. Um, most of the material that you're going to see here in a lot of the pictures and stuff come out of the book that Gary mentioned. Um, I brought a copy of it that I can pass around later on if you want to take a look at it. It's um, on Amazon, but you can probably get a better deal if you wanted it from the publisher, which is Springer. Uh, they have an ebook copy, and you can actually buy individual <coughs> chapters as well from Springer. So if there's just a chapter on, say, cover lenses that you're interested in, you can just go get that one chapter. So let's start at the very beginning. What does PCAP stand for? PCAP stands for Projected Capacitive. Um, it's projected because you are projecting an electric field, and it's capacitive because we're using essentially a capacitor to create that electric field. Now, if you look at your standard capacitor, standard two plate capacitor is going to look something like this. Of course, in real life, they're almost never like this, but this is the theory. You've got a two plate capacitor, you have an electric field that's created between the two plates, and then you also have some electric field that extends out around the edges, and this is generally called the fringe field. So you have sort of two field components here. You have the field that's trapped in between the plates, and then you have the field that's extending around the edges of the capacitor and out into space. And what we're going to do is take that device, and we're going to use it to start detecting touches. Well, how do we do that? Well, first, if you think of a standard capacitor, you put some voltage in, you've got some resistance, you ground it. Essentially, what you're doing is charging up the capacitor. You're dumping that voltage and storing it on the capacitor. So when you start dumping that voltage in, if you measure the voltage right here, it doesn't immediately go to that voltage. It ramps up slowly as the capacitor charges up. If I then put a <coughs> rod that's grounded somewhere close to that capacitor, what happens is that some of that electric field couples over to that grounded rod. So now when I'm charging up the capacitor, it actually takes longer to charge it because some of the energy is essentially getting dumped 
over into this ground over here. So I can look at the differences between when I'm charging it without the finger or the grounded rod close to it, and when I'm charging it with the finger or the grounded rod close to it, and I can measure those two differences in how it charges and say, oh, there must be something close to that. And I can actually look at how the charge changes over time and actually figure out what the distance is. I can say it's you know, roughly you know, half the way to the next capacitor or whatever that, that sort of ratiometric kind of distance is. Essentially, I can look at how the electric field changes and figure out, oh, there's something close by. So here's an example of what that looks like. So this is a charging um, graph for the capacitor. If I don't have anything close to it, my charging graph might look like this. So I have no rod, it charges up relatively quickly in an exponential curve. If I put my rod a little bit close to it, it charges up a little more slowly because again, some of that energy is essentially getting sucked out into that grounded rod. If I put it even closer, then it charges up even more slowly. So I can look at that curve and figure out essentially what's going on. Now, how do I do that? How do I actually figure out where the thing is versus how it's charging? How do I measure that charge? Well, one way you can look at it in theory, you could say, oh, well, let's just pick a nice easy point. Let's pick this point right here, and let's wait, you know, however many tenths of a millionth of a second that's going to be, and let's measure the voltage and see which of these three curves I seem to be on. Well, there are a couple problems with that. One is each capacitor in your touchscreen is going to be a little bit different. <coughs> so this magic point that looks nice and pretty and easily discernible here on another capacitor further down the touchscreen that might actually give you a piece here where they're a lot closer together and it's harder to tell which one is which. Or the opposite, you might end up with a point this uh, here on the curve, depending on how that curve is changing for each capacitor. So you can't really go in and sort of cherry pick the nice easy region where the curves are nice and separate and figure out what the, the magic time is. And then of course the other problem is that you have to nail down the exact time perfectly and measure that voltage within you know, microseconds or nanoseconds to make sure you got the exact right time. So really, practically, that just doesn't work. Um, the much easier thing to do is if you go back to your calculus from college and look at the curves, if you measure the area under the curve, that's going to be a much better indicator of what's going on. Plus, it gives you information from not just a single snapshot, but from basically from the whole time. So you get all the information about what's happening from the beginning all the way down to wherever you want to stop. So maybe you stop right here. So what we do is we take that output from the capacitor and we put it into an integrator and the integrator essentially measures how much of the area under that curve and then from that I can figure out this area is not a finger, this amount of area means there is a finger, this amount of area means the finger is closer. You know, as the area changes I can essentially turn that into a distance. That's a really rough, obviously non-mathematical way of describing it, but does that make sense? Any questions mm -hmm. about that? Everybody good? Okay. Mm -hmm. So, now imagine I take that capacitor and I make a grid of them. So I now have a whole bunch of these capacitors in rows and columns. And I bring a finger in, my finger is my grounded rod. I bring my finger in and my finger is now affecting these three capacitors a lot. So these three capacitors change quite a bit. These capacitors change a little bit because the finger is close enough to pull off some of the charge but not very much. And then these capacitors out here don't change hardly at all. So if I look at how each one of these capacitors changes, I can then start to interpolate and figure out where the finger is in space, in two dimensions. I can say, okay, this one changed a whole lot. These two changed um, a little bit, but not quite as much as that one. This one changed a little bit more than that one. So I know my finger is closer to that one. I know it's closer to this one. And I can look at how those all change and figure out essentially, oh, the finger is 20% of the distance between here and here, and it's 80% of the distance between here and here, and essentially I can go in and nail down exactly where that finger is with my grid of capacitors. Okay? Everybody good? Now how do I turn that into a coordinate system? Well, is I think better, my capacitors... Is it better to have fat fingers or thin fingers? Um, fat fingers are generally better. Um, what you're doing here is essentially coupling into the electric field. So the more presence you have in the electric field, the better. And that's why a finger is much easier to pick up than, say, a skinny stylus. Yeah. If you have a really skinny stylus, you, you're essentially not going to couple as much of that electric field as you will with a big fat finger. Um, that's also why, if you think about it, a lot of people will touch a touch sensor, and if it doesn't work very well, they're pushed down harder. 
Well, it's not the force that actually matters. It's not like a resistive where when you're pressing it, you're literally deforming the touch sensor. When you mash down on it, all you're really doing is putting more of your finger in that electric field. So it's really about how much of your finger is coupling to that electric field, how close it is, how fat it is, you know, et cetera. Um, another interesting topic behind, uh, behind this, by the way, is that we talk about the finger as a ground. It's not really a ground. It's really a virtual ground, obviously. You don't actually have to be grounded. You don't have to be standing on a, you know ESD floor with a heel strap on. Your body essentially acts like a virtual ground to the circuit. It pulls enough of that energy off that it can tell the difference. Now, that being said, if you really are grounded, or if your device is grounded, or if your device is floating, or if you're using a stylus that's grounded, or if you're using a stylus that's floating, all of those are going to behave slightly differently. So that's why sometimes you'll see, um, you know, if you walk up to, I saw a, a demo once, it was actually kind of funny. Somebody was showing a touch sensor, and they had it sitting on a table, and what they did was put down a conductive mat underneath it, so that when you walked up and stood on the conductive mat and touched the touch sensor, you got pretty good touch response. But what they didn't think about was the fact that you're wearing shoes, and you don't have a ground strap, and you know, it doesn't really, and so, when you have to touch the thing, it kind of sort of worked because it wasn't really set to be sensitive enough. Because whoever set it up thought, oh, the person's going to be grounded. Well, they're not really grounded. They're virtually <laughs> grounded. So you got a little weaker signal when you walked up to the thing, even though they put a ground mat down. So you got to think about all of that when it comes to designing your touch sensor, thinking about how people are going to use it, where they're going to use it. You know, are they going to use a stylus? How big is the stylus? What's the material of the stylus? Are they going to have gloves on? How thick are the gloves? The material of the glove doesn't matter all that much, but it can make a difference. All that figures into it because, again, what you're doing here is coupling to an electric field. And everything that affects that coupling affects how well the touch panel works. So the, the pitch between the rows and the columns um, defines or really is affected by two requirements. One is how close do I need to be able to get my fingers and still be able to tell that I have two fingers on the screen instead of one? That's called the pitch separation. So first thing is, if I want to get a really tight pinch separation, I need my electrodes to be very close together, so I get really good resolution. Second thing is, if I want to use a very small stylus, again, I need my pitch to be very close together. So let's say, worst case scenario, I might want to use a one millimeter stylus. Um, I've seen a demo where somebody used a number two pencil. I want to detect a number two pencil as a stylus. I'm probably going to have to have an electrode pitch of about four, maybe four and a half millimeters. So on a cell phone, they're typically going to be in that four to five millimeter kind of range because they want to work with passive stylus. They want to have really good pinch separation so that you can you know, put your fingers in and do a zoom and a pinch and get really good resolution. So when you're talking about a cell phone or a tablet or anything that follows the Windows certification logo, they're going to have about a four to four and a half millimeter pitch. Um, our products, because we tend to do, uh, again, medical, industrial embedded, you know, big fat finger CNC control machine kind of stuff, we tend to have a wider pitch because it means we can use fewer electrodes, which means we might be able to use a smaller chip. So in industrial applications, the pitch could be more like seven to eight millimeters. So what that means is if you take your cell phone and figured out what the dimensions were and divided it by about four, you would come up with how many electrodes you have. That one's probably going to be um, maybe 18 by 25, 18 by 30, something like that. Okay, so how do I turn my touch into a coordinate? Well, what I do is essentially create a magic coordinate system that applies to my touch screen. One of the interesting things about this is, how do I know where the boundaries are of my coordinate system? Well, I could, in theory, take the center of that outer ring of capacitors and say, <laughs> that's zero. That's the beginning of my active area. But in real life, my electric field extends past that. So I'm, I'm sort of wasting some of that space or some of that energy if I essentially put my, elect, my capacitors right along the edge of the boundary that I wanted to detect. So generally what you do is you take a half of the electrode pitch, whatever this distance is from the center here to the center here, and you say half of that is going to be where my edge is that I can detect. My electric field from this capacitor sticking you know, ascending out a little bit over to that side. Again, that kind of depends on the application. Um, some people in some applications will actually bring that edge in a little bit closer to the capacitors, which really means what you're doing is essentially making the whole touch panel a little bit bigger so that the active area of the touch panel extends past the viewing area of the display. 
And that can be helpful when you want to do like a side swipe. You actually want to detect the finger coming in before it gets to the physical viewable part of your display. So there's some times when you might actually want to do that. But again, in, in our kind of applications, embedded applications, what we really want to do is get the smallest border we can. So we tend to bring that as, you know, make it as small as we can in terms of where the electrodes are going to be. So take a half of a pitch. You essentially say, okay, if that's going to be zero, and then go out to the very end over here, and this is going to be the end, and let's all be nice software engineers and use powers of two because they love that. I'll make this 1023 for my coordinate system. I'll make that zero. And then it's real easy. All you got to do is essentially go and figure out what's the coordinate position for the center of each of those columns. Do the same thing this way. That's zero, that's 1023. Figure out what the center is going to be for each of those rows, and poof, I get a coordinate system. So when I put a finger right here, and I know that it's mostly on this capacitor, a little bit on that one, a little bit on that one, a little bit on that one, I interpolate, I figure out my finger's physically here, then I can go in and say, okay, that's going to be 455 and you know, 289, or whatever the magic number ends up being. So that, in essence, is how I take a finger, use a bunch of capacitors, and turn it into a coordinate. That's sort of the soup to nuts of how touch panel works. Now, there's obviously a lot more behind it, um, and we'll talk a little bit more about some of the details, but really, that, in essence, is what you're doing. You have a giant grid of capacitors, you put a finger down, you interpolate based on how those capacitors change, you turn that into a coordinate, and poof, you've got a nice printed touch panel. That, that was kind of mm -hmm. fast. Any questions about that? Yeah, how often do you charge the capacitors? So there are, um, I'm trying to remember if I have a slide on calibration. I don't remember if I do, so I'll talk about that now. And if we come on that slide, then I'll just skip over it. So when I turn the thing on, the first thing I have to do is go measure <clears throat> the capacitance for each one of those capacitors, because they're all going to be a little bit different. And especially the ones that are further away from my charging circuit are going to be different, because the signal has to travel down that whole electrode to get to that last capacitor. So the last capacitor is going to behave very differently than my first capacitor. So the first thing I do when I turn the thing on is go off and essentially measure each of these capacitances. Now, in the actual software, it's not really measuring capacitance. There's not you know, a variable in there somewhere that you could go look at that says it's X picofarads. They don't really care about how many picofarads it is. It, you know, it turns into some non-unitized number internally, because they really don't care about picofarads. All they really care about is how much it changes. So if, the, you, know, if you get some A to D measurement and it's 810 out of 1024, then later on I see 710 out of 1024, and it changed by you know, roughly 10%. And I can go and look at that and use that to do a mind interpolation. But what's really happening in the background is I'm measuring each of these capacitances. So I measure each of the capacitances at power up, I store a table of that, then I go off and start doing a scan. And I remeasure, and I remeasure, and remeasure, and remeasure, and remeasure, and remeasure, and remeasure. And then when the figure comes in, I measure the new capacitances, I compare them to the originals, and that's how I know that they change, and that's how I figure out where the finger is. How often that happens depends on several things. Generally speaking, if you run your touch panel as fast as you possibly can and you don't care about power, you're going to run a cycle depending on the controller, every maybe three to 10 milliseconds. So every three to 10 milliseconds, it's gonna go off and do a new measurement of everything, a new calculation of where the fingers are, how many fingers are, et cetera. If I'm in a power, um, uh, a, a kind of device where I'm worried about power, then I might slow that down. I might, for example, only scan maybe every 20 or 50 milliseconds when there's not a touch, but then as soon as I see a touch, then I go to high speed scan mode and I go into my three to you know, 10 millisecond kind of scan. Um, or I might be in a device where I'm worried about power all the time. And so even when there's a finger present, I might only scan it every 10 milliseconds or 15 milliseconds. Because in this particular application, I'm not worried about trying to draw the Mona Lisa or capture a signature. All I want to know is did they hit a button or not? Or are they doing a pinch or a zoom? And I don't really care about how fine of a detail I get on that. So it's all kind of controlled by what your power requirements are. Um, again, in our kinds of applications, 90% probably are plugged into the wall. So most of the time with our touch panels, we just run them at the highest possible speed. Um, the only exceptions to that really are emissions. 
in some cases you're worried about emissions. And what you're doing with this touch panel is essentially spewing electric field out into the world. And some people don't like that. So you have to control how often you spew that electric field, what the frequency is. I mean, you might have to tone it down just for the emissions reasons. But most of the time, if you don't have to worry about emissions, you just scan as fast as you can. It's going to be 3 to 10 milliseconds. Does that answer your question? Yes. Okay. So, next step. I have this grid of capacitors. We talked about these nice you know, two-plate capacitors. Um, I'm going to connect them up in kind of a weird way. And the reason I'm going to do this is because I don't really want to connect literally each individual capacitor with wires. Right? If I did, and if I measured this, I've, I don't remember how many rows and columns I've got. Let's say there's you know, eight rows and ten columns. I'd have 80 capacitors. I'd literally have 160 wires if I wanted to connect each capacitor individually. Obviously, I'm not going to do that. So instead, what I do is something very similar to a keyboard matrix. I'm going to essentially connect them in rows and columns. So I have all of my rows here connected as one electrode, starting down there and going across the top. That's the top plate. I'm going to call that X0, my first X electrode. I'm going to take my next row, connect those all up. That's X1. Go all the way down to X5. So now I have all of my top plates connected together in my rows. Then I go and take all the bottom plates, and I connect those together and call those Ys. There's a little bit of industry standardization here in how these things are labeled. Um, usually, not everybody follows this rule, but usually X is the drive circuit. So X is where I'm dumping my voltage into the capacitor. Y is my measurement circuit. I'm actually measuring the output, the bottom plate of the capacitor. Now, that's a little bit different than the first image I showed, where I had a standard capacitor, I had voltage coming into it, and the bottom plate was grounded. Okay? In a touch panel, you're not really doing that. What you're really doing is dumping voltage into the top plate, but instead of grounding the bottom plate, you're actually connecting it to an integrator. And so it, it's kind of a funky way of using a capacitor, but it's essentially the same concept. You're still measuring essentially how long does it take the energy to get from one plate to the other, to couple across. But also, if you're you know, familiar with capacitors, it might look kind of weird because I'm not grounding the bottom plate, I'm actually running it into an integrator. So I have this matrix of X lines and Y lines. I put a pulse, a voltage, on this X0 line. That voltage travels down. And while I'm doing that, I measure all of my Y lines simultaneously. So I dump my pulse down. I go measure here, 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 here. And that then gives me a capacitance, in essence, for each of those capacitors in that row. Then I do the same thing. I dump a pulse down X1, measure all my Ys, and I get capacitance for each of those capacitors. I repeat that process for however many Y lines I have, and I get my nice pretty table of capacitances. Okay, so I have this grid of capacitors. How do I actually make this thing? How do I build it? What does it look like? I, I need it to be transparent because I'm going to put a display behind it. I need it to be a low resistance material because I'm putting this pulse down it. And so if I have a high resistance material at the first capacitor, I might have this nice pretty, you know, 3.3 volt pulse. But by the time I get to my last capacitor, I might have a you know, 0.1 volt pulse. So I've got to have somewhat low resistance material so that when I get to the end of it, my pulse still has enough energy to give me a good charge circuit. And then finally, I need to have some way to connect all that stuff to some kind of circuit board that's actually going to do all this measurement and, and drive pulse and everything else. So first, let's talk about the transparent part. Um, there are multiple transparent conductors available. Um, and Calling them transparent conductors is a bit of a misnomer in some cases. The one of the only <coughs> truly transparent conductive substances that we have available is ITO, indium tin oxide. Um, ITO is mostly transparent. Depends on how you set it up, how much mix of indium to tin you have. Um, but generally speaking, you're going to get about 90%, maybe 93% transmittance through it. So if you put light through it, what comes out on the other side is going to be about 90 to 93 percent of that light will make it through. Okay? But the material itself is literally transparent, meaning it's not like you have some part that you can't see through and then next to it there's empty space and it averages out to 93 percent. No, the whole thing is transparent. It's 93, 90 percent transmissivity. 
There are other kinds of conductors like silver wire, um, um, nano wires, um, mesh wires, copper, all kinds of stuff where what you really have are these little tiny conductors that are maybe, I don't know, a micron, a micron and a half wide, and the conductors themselves are not see-through, but they are put in a substrate that is see-through. So technically, the conductor itself isn't see-through, it's not transparent. Indium tin oxide actually is transparent. The, you have a whole surface of it, you can still see through it. So the resistance of that material is defined by the way it's manufactured. It's typically between 60 ohms per square and 200 ohms per square. If you've never seen ohms per square, that might look a little bit weird. Um, one of the slides I have near the end is uh, explains what ohms per square means and how it's calculated. What it, you know, basically, why do you get a number that says 200 ohms per square, no matter how big of the piece of material is? If we have time, we'll get into that. But if not, um, you can always start. You can pass this out, right? It's going to be available. That's all right with you. Yeah, I, we can make it available. You can go look at the slides on your own. And there's a whole like five, six pages in my book where I explain essentially how this works and, and why it works. But the rough idea of ohms per square is anytime you're looking at a sheet of material that's conductive, whether it's copper, silver, ITO, whatever, if you take that sheet of conductive material and you cut a square out and you measure it across the square, you're going to get a certain resistance. And if you double the size of that square and you measure again, you're going to get the exact same resistance. And it, it may sound kind of weird, but it works. And the reason it works is because, if you think about it, as, the, as I double the size of my square this direction, I'm also doubling it in this direction. So I'm essentially adding resistance this way, but I'm also adding parallel resistance this way. And what actually ends up happening is the two cancel each other out. So you can think of it as, if I had two resistors in series, and then I put two more resistors in series, but I connected all that in parallel, I essentially get the same R that I started with. Because I have two R this way, two R this way, half R and half R, they cancel each other out and I can just get R. So no matter how big my sheet is, I essentially get a certain resistance. That's why it's always quoted as ohms per square, no matter how big the square is. Hmm. Okay, lower resistance has worse optical properties. If I go down to low resistance, like say 30 ohms per square, um, the problem with that is it starts to get a little bit yellow, the transmittance starts to go down, it might be 85, 86%. So generally speaking, you want to stay away from low resistances like 15, 30 ohms per square. 60 ohms per square is sort of the bare minimum you can kind of get away with for a touch panel. Um, and even then, under certain circumstances, you still might be able to see the pattern. Um, better would be 100 ohms per square. 200 ohms per square might be what they use on a small touch screen like a cell phone. But if you're looking at, say, you know, a 24-inch, it's really hard to get that to work with 60 ohms per square. Because by the time you go down that whole electrode, you end up with a lot of resistance. Okay, so I'm going to use ITO. <coughs> I could actually go and make my ITO pattern look just like my grid of two-plate capacitors. I could essentially make a little plate in ITO, another little plate, and I could connect them with a little skinny trace. And I could do that on the same, on the bottom. And in theory, I can make a touch panel that way. But there's some problems with it. One of the problems is when I go and create this pattern in ITO, essentially what I've done is taken away the ITO in the center section and then have a double stack of ITO right here. So here my transmittance is going to be different than here. And that means the pattern is going to be more visible. Essentially, if you look at a piece of material that has a pattern in it in ITO, anywhere that that pattern changes from ITO to not ITO, you're going to have a line that you may or may not be able to see. The higher the resistance, the harder it is to see it, but as you go down in resistance, it gets easier to see. So what I've done here is sort of the worst thing possible. I have a double stack of ITO in one area. I have a completely empty stack of ITO in this area. So the boundary between the two is really detectable. So optically, this is a terrible idea. Electrically, it's also a terrible idea. And the reason it is a bad idea electrically is because all of my electric field, not all of it, but a large portion of it, is going to be between the two plates. It doesn't do me any good. The field that's trapped between those two plates can't detect a finger. It doesn't couple. What helps me here is the field that is essentially around the edge of the capacitor. All that field that's trapped in the middle, though, doesn't really do me any good. So what I really want to do is take this pattern and change it. I want to slide the plates so they're not on top of each other. And then I also 
want to change the pattern so that it's optically better. So in theory, I have ITO, as much ITO as I can over the whole thing, a single layer of ITO in every area if possible, so that when the user looks through it, they're only looking through one layer of ITO, and there are little tiny skinny areas where there's no ITO, but try to minimize that as much as possible. Okay? And because I'm running a little bit slow on time, I'm going to skip over a couple of slides here and get to the final answer. That essentially is what the ITO pattern looks like. Hmm. So you've heard probably of the diamond pattern. That's what this is. Everybody calls it a diamond pattern because it looks like a bunch of diamonds. So I have a row going this way, row there, row there, and then underneath it I have a column, and a column, and a column. And you see that here the two patterns cross over each other. So this is all ITO. This is ITO. The only place where there isn't ITO is in this little skinny band in between them. Okay? Everybody see that? That makes sense? Obviously, it's colored here so you can see it, but in real life, you wouldn't be able to see it. It's not going to be you know, yellow and blue in real life. It'll be transparent. Um, you might be able to make out these boundary lines here, depending on the resistance and the TFT and whether it's turned on, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But essentially, this is going to be an invisible pattern. Now, originally, we had these nice, pretty plate capacitors. And if you look at this, you might think, oh, that's one of the plates of my capacitors. Well, actually, it's not. That's one of the things that's a little confusing about this pattern. The actual capacitor is here. So this is what we call a cell. The capacitor itself, literally, is that little crossover point right there. That's my plate capacitor that I started with. And what I've done now is essentially extended that plate capacitor by making these two triangles on either side of it, on both sides. And I get this nice big fringe field across this gap on all four edges. So I get this nice pretty big electric field, extends way out into space, it's not captured between the two plates, and I also get the benefit of having my ITO pattern spread out so that I don't have areas where there's double ITO and then areas where there's you know, a whole bunch of blank ITO that you can see through. So it gives me a nice uniform pattern and it also gives me a nice electric field that extends out into space that I can detect. Everybody good? Mm -hmm. So what does that really look like? Well, here's the bottom layer, bottom layer plates, here's the top plate, and you see that that electric field is now much bigger, extends way out into space, it's not trapped between the two plates, so I get a much bigger field that I can then couple to much easier with a finger. Okay? okay? What does that really look like when I put it on a touch panel? Well, that is what the final thing actually looks like. Again, with the idea that this pattern is invisible, of course, in real life, you can't see it. What you would see is a big blank area, and then outside of that, you'll see these pads, usually silver. That's where you transition from your ITO to silver traces. Because once you get outside the viewing area, you want to cut down the resistance as much as possible. Silver or copper or you know, whatever is going to have a much lower resistance than ITO. So once you get outside the viewing area, you switch to a visible conductor like silver. So you have these traces that come out, go up to the edge of the glass, have little landing pads there on the edge of the glass, and what I do is then take an FPC, a flexible printed circuit, and I stick it on the glass in those locations. And the FPC is essentially going to be just a single layer flexible printed circuit with some copper traces in it, some pads on it, and I take those pads and I bond them down to the glass. Um, all of the pictures that I've shown you so far are based on a two-dimensional touch panel where I have two separate physical layers, a bottom layer and a top layer. I can't actually make a touch panel where they are coplanar, but they're on the same piece of glass. It's a little bit complicated. I basically have to do a little highway passovers. Like if you think of, you know, outer on 75, every time those two little lines cross each other, they can't physically cross if they're on the same plane, so I have to basically build a little overpass, okay? So I can do that kind of design. Um, I haven't shown it just because it's typically a consumer design. Not a lot of embedded industrial medical stuff uses it. But just so you don't get confused, Touch panels come in all shapes and sizes. Some of them are single layers. Yes, Javier? How, how old is this technology? Oh, that's a good question. Um, people have been building capacitive touch panels for probably, well, let me back up. People have been using capacitance to detect a finger or distance or a change for probably 40 or 50 years. Mm. Um, it took a long time for the technology to sort of ripen to, first of all, become um, usable over an LCD so that you can see through it and see through it clearly and have good quality ITO 
to come up with a way to etch the patterns, create the patterns, develop the controllers that could essentially do all of this and do it at high speed. Because um, if you think about it, if I've got you know, a fairly large touch panel and I need to take a measurement of every one of those capacitors every five milliseconds, that's a crap load of processing power. You know, I could do that with an 8051. Um, then, of course, it's the TFTs themselves. Go back and look 10 years ago what the cost of a uh, 5.7-inch TFT was. It was ridiculous. Mm -hmm. Now it's really cheap. So until I had TFTs to put a touch panel over, it didn't really do me a whole lot of good to have a whole lot of touch panels out there. Um, it really all started with the iPhone in, what was that, 2007, 2006? It's in the book, I don't remember the date. But when the iPhone came out, that started this whole rush of a couple of things. One, it gave people this understanding of what you could do with a touch panel. You know, suddenly you could do pinch and zoom. And everybody just thought that was the coolest thing in the world. And then secondly, it created a whole infrastructure and a whole support system for touch panels that you know, created demand and at the same time created this whole market. And so suddenly everybody was like, ooh, I gotta get me a touch panel. I wanna look just like the iPhone. I can't tell you how many people come to us with their you know, ventilator or their um, uh, CD player or their whatever and say, I want it to look like an iPhone. You know, it needs to be like an iPhone. It needs to work like an iPhone. Well, okay, let's talk about what that really means. And, you know, are you going to put saline on it and blood? Because your iPhone won't work if you put blood on it. Um, are you going to use gloves with it? Because if you put it on a thick glove, your iPhone's not going to work with that. Um, you know, how much do you want to spend? The, you know, there's a whole lot of complication in terms of the mechanical design. But that essentially is what everybody starts with. They all come in and say, I, I want my XYZ product to look like an iPhone. Because that's where it all started at. Okay, so I take these flexible circuits, I bond them to the glass. Again, here I'm showing it as two separate layers, so there's one on the top that's down this way and the pads are underneath it. This one's on the bottom, pads are on top and the you know, thing gets stuck to the bottom. Um, this, I, I threw this in here and it's probably a little more detailed than you want, but if you want to review it later, um, when you get the presentation, you're welcome to go through it. Essentially, this shows you the circuit diagram of what's happening in the background. There are a whole bunch of individual capacitors that make up one cell that I'm trying to measure. I have the finger coming in, I have a capacitance from my finger to the X electrode, I have a capacitance from my finger to the Y electrode, I have a capacitance from this X electrode to that, or that X electrode to that Y electrode, from that one to that one, from that one to that one. I have all these individual capacitances. I have capacitances from that electrode down to ground, there, there are, you know, in this simple little diagram, there's something like 20 capacitors. So it's a really complicated circuit, actually, in terms of what's actually happening. So, I now have this way of measuring all these capacitances. I go out and, you know, look at the original signal versus what my new signal is. I compare the two, subtract one from the other, and I essentially end up with this nice, pretty 3D surface map. And my nice, pretty 3D surface map shows me where the capacitance is changing, and if I put three fingers down, I'm going to see these nice three peaks. Then what I do is apply some kind of qualification to those peaks to determine whether they really are a touch. And I do that usually with just an easy single number. I go in and say, you know, if this peak is, say, a thousand counts, whatever that count means, if this is a thousand, I might set my touch threshold to, say, 700 or 800. So anything that's above 800, I'm going to say, oh, that's a finger. In this case, I apply my touch threshold, I see three touches, I go and calculate the coordinates of the touches, and I send them off to the OS to do whatever it wants to do. Um, one of the interesting things about this technology is the number of touches. So, in theory, I could detect an infinite number of touches with this technology. Um, in practice, I can't really do that. But the point being that, you know, if you talk about wanting to do 10 touches, 20 touches, 50 touches, in theory, all of that is possible. There are a couple of things that keep you from doing that. One is, how large physically is your touch panel? If I'm, if you don't mind me using your cell phone to get this an example, right? If I've got this little tiny cell phone, I can't really get 20 fingers on this cell phone and have each finger be separately, individually detectable. Because they're all going to end up touching each other and get too close together. So first, obviously, is the size of the touch screen. The second one is going to be the pitch of the electrodes, which again has to do with how close my fingers can get. And the third is just processing time. It takes time to go off and look for all of those individual signals and qualify them. So all the controller vendors out there put some kind of, of sort of uh, fake limit on how many touches they can detect. It has nothing to do with the touch screen. It has nothing to do with technology. It's simply about uh, how much processing time they're willing to dedicate to go qualify touches. 
So um, one controller that we use, which is an Atmel controller, it was actually bought by Microchip, but we still call them Atmel, everybody does. They can detect up to 16 touches. Um, another controller we use, ETI, can do 10 touches. Uh, when you get to the larger ones that do like you know a 50 inch TV, um, those are made for collaborative environments, so those might be able to detect 15 or 20 touches because you might have you know four or five people. But again, the, the idea here is I can detect in theory as many touches as I have physical space and processing time to detect. Okay, stacks. So I talked a little bit about you know you've got this stuff called intuman oxide and you've got an LCD and how do you put it all together and what are the individual parts? So here I'm showing two different options for how I might make a touch sensor. You'll see that there's space in between these layers that's just for um, clarity. In theory, of course, they're all actually put right next to each other. I have a piece of glass here. That red line is the ITO on top of my glass. So I get a piece of glass that already has ITO on it. And then I do an etch process, typically, or a laser process, where I go and remove the ITO I don't want. There are ways you can actually print the electrodes, but they simply are not cost effective right now for most um, applications. So almost everybody does it this way. They buy a sheet of glass or plastic with the ITO on it, and then they etch away what they don't want. So I have a glass, ITO, then I have an optically clear adhesive, to simply, uh, essentially like double-sided sticky tape. Then I have another piece of glass with my ITO on it. That's going to be my second layer for my touchscreen. And then I have another layer of OCA, and then I have some kind of cover lens on top. Now again, there are 15 different stacks, and if you um, look in the book or in the chapter or on stack ups, I show something like six or eight different variations of this. So here I just cover uh, two of them to give you an idea. But there are some people, especially if you're in a high volume application, like a cell phone, where you can actually put ITO on the back side of your cover lens. And then you can also put those little crossovers that I talked about on the back side of the cover lens. So you could actually have a cover lens with the touch sensor built literally on the bottom of the cover lens as a single piece. There are other people that will put it directly into the LCD. So if I have an LCD underneath this thing, I can actually put my touch panel into the LCD and build it as part of the LCD. So there are a whole bunch of different ways to do it. These are just two examples. This is called glass, 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 GGG, because I've got a piece of glass here, a piece of glass here, and a piece of glass there. This is the more common construction that we use for most of our applications. GG2, it's also known as double-sided ITO. Here I have a single piece of glass, ITO on both sides of it. And again, I do an etch process, so I create my Y electrodes, my X electrodes. I have my optical clear piece of my cover lens, slap all that together, and I have a touch screen with a cover lens on. And what's the cost impact in that? 50%? In, in what? Using one Between the two? Yeah. So there, there are several trade-offs here to look at. One is obviously here I'm eliminating two pieces. I'm eliminating a layer of glass and a layer of OCA. So I have less material costs, I have less processing costs. Um, however, this piece of glass with double ITO on it is a little more than double the price of that piece of glass with a single layer of ITO. And the processing is a little bit more complicated because when I process it, I have to protect the side that I'm not processing. So you know, think of it again if I'm doing like an edge process. I'm going to put this in some kind of chemical bath, or maybe I'm going to hit it with a laser or whatever. I've got to make sure I don't mess up the side I'm not trying to mess with. Then I've got to flip it over and mess with that side, but not mess up the side that I already did. I've got to have fiducials to make sure everything lines up nice and pretty. So it's not quite half the cost. It's a little more than half the cost. Um, but it, it all kind of depends on the size and a whole bunch of variables. But it's not half. It's a little more than half. And why would you do one versus the other? Um, size, Clarity, space, or? cost. Um, Generally speaking, anytime you add something in the stack, you're going to lose a little bit of your optical properties, you're going to lose a little transmittance, you're going to have a little more reflectance, a little less clarity, etc. Um, obviously, you're you know, giving up two pieces of material, so there's a bit of better yield issues there. Um, you have a lower weight. You know, there are a lot of reasons that you might want to use this option. So it's more reliable than second off? Yeah, I, the reliability, really, if you, if you have the right manufacturing process and it's dialed in, you're not going to see a huge yield difference between these two. There will be a little bit, just because, you know, mistakes happen. But generally speaking, there's not going to be a gigantic yield difference between the two. Um, there's not going to be a big difference in terms of field failures between the two. It's really more about cost and space and weight. Um, also, by the way, everything I'm showing here is glass for the substrate for the ITO. You can also use plastic. Um, PMMA um, and, um, oh, my brain stopped working. What's the other standard? Uh, um, polycarbonate. Um, polycarbonate is the most common. So a lot of people do polycarbonate and have ITO on the back. 
There are issues with polycarbonate, though, um, and again, I get into this in the book, not here in the presentation, where you start to have weird effects with polarized sunglasses. So if you're looking at it outdoors, you actually don't want to use polycarbonate in your touchscreen because it can cause all kinds of weird rainbow effects. So what's the advantage of the Triple G if it's the right side is cheaper? Um, well, from a processing standpoint, this is a little bit simpler because you don't have to manage the two separate, you know, two different layers of ITO and handling the edge process. Um, secondly, it can be a little bit more robust because you've essentially got more shock absorbing in this stack up than you do in that. Okay, um, I'm going to try and wrap this up real quick. This is just an idea of how you would mount this thing. So I've got some kind of ledge built into my vessel, and I put a gasket material on the back of the cover lens, and I stick the whole thing in from the front. And I, of course, can make this ledge as big or as small as I want, so I can have it be very skinny, come up just to the edge of the glass, and create that iPhone bezel-less look if I wanted to. Um, the LCD goes on the bottom. There are two different ways to do the LCD. You can put on a gasket that goes around the outside, and you get an air gap. Um, optically, it's not a great idea, but it's really cheap. Or you can actually do an optical adhesive layer to put your LCD on. The optics is way better, but it's also a little more expensive. Uh, okay, we've gone to the additional info. Obviously, we're out of time. I'll skip over this. We talked about sheet resistance, um, gloves and stylus, why they don't work very well, water, which is a tricky question. Um, and hydrophobic coatings for water, and that's it.